The opinions expressed in this episode do not necessarily reflect those of the Murderish podcast. Sensitive topics are discussed. Listener discretion is advised. Since the 1880s, immigrants from all over the globe have arrived in the United States hoping to attain a better quality of life. The American Dream's main principle has always been the same. If you work hard, you can accomplish anything. Like so many immigrants before them, Lily and Ben Chin wanted their son Vincent to have more opportunities than he may have had in their native China. But unlike the vast majority of Detroit residents during the 1970s and 80s, the Chins were not white. According to the U.S. Census Bureau, a 1980 census revealed Asian Americans made up less than 1% of the city's population of 1.2 million people. At a time when tensions were high between Japanese and American automobile manufacturers, 27-year-old Vincent Chin suddenly found himself in peril on the streets of Motor City. His story reminds us why this landmark case is still relevant more than 40 years later. This is Jamie, and you're listening to Murderish. Join me as I walk you through the case involving Vincent Chin. In the 1980s, Detroit, Michigan was in a state of complete upheaval. Unemployment rates were at an all-time high, well above the national average. According to the New York Times, from the late 1970s through the mid-80s, the automobile industry represented 60% of manufacturing jobs in Michigan. International competition was a real threat to job security, especially in Detroit. Tens of thousands of workers were laid off from auto factory jobs, making the jobless rate swell as high as 15% at that time. Detroit was home to three titans of the American automobile industry, Ford, Chrysler, and General Motors. A great deal of national pride revolved around owning an American-made car, especially during a time when foreign imports were cutting into domestic profits. Japan's big three car manufacturers were Toyota, Honda, and Datsun, which is now Nissan. Part of what made the success of these companies so impactful was the rate at which they could produce cars. Japanese auto factories were equipped with the latest technology, allowing machines to assemble cars faster and more efficiently than American assembly lines. As a result of the 1979 oil crisis, The early 1980s saw American gas prices skyrocket. Detroit's automobile moguls scoffed at the threat of oil shortages, but their factories and machines had fallen into gradual disrepair since World War II. Meanwhile, manufacturers in Japan and Canada had invested their profits in newer machines and increased employee wages. Less manpower was needed for the production process, and fewer workers meant higher profits. This also meant that cars imported from Japan were more affordable to the average American consumer. Japanese cars were also more fuel efficient, which added extra appeal at a time when gas would go from 60 cents to $1.41 per gallon overnight. With the demand for American cars receding, several Detroit factories were closed. The resulting job loss led people to drain their life savings, leaving many people with no choice but to declare bankruptcy. Eventually, Detroit became a shadow of its former self. Residents migrated away from the city for employment opportunities, and once bustling neighborhoods became littered with abandoned buildings. In addition to the economic impact, there were also cultural implications. Many jobless American auto workers sought a scapegoat for their plight and directed their aggressions toward Asian Americans. Asian American rights activist Helen Zia worked as a large press operator at a Chrysler stamping plant before being laid off. In an interview for Paula Yu's book, From a Whisper to a Rallying Cry, Zia said, There was a lot of hatred spreading against Japan and anybody who looked Japanese. Every Asian American felt it. You had to watch your back. You had to be careful what car you were driving. 
This was the cultural climate 27-year-old Vincent Chin was surrounded by when he was brutally attacked on June 19, 1982. Vincent Jen Chin was born on May 18, 1955, in Canton, China. He was adopted at age six by Lily and David Chin, who were also Cantonese. David Bing Hing Chin, otherwise known as David, arrived in America at age 17 and enlisted in the U.S. Army during World War II. His service earned him citizenship, enabling him to bring Lily to America. Lily met David during one of his visits back home. She knew the family of her husband-to-be and was excited to join him in America once they were married. Lily was also slightly apprehensive about living in America. She had grown up hearing stories of racial persecution from her great-grandfather, who had done backbreaking work on the Transcontinental Railroad before being driven out. Lily thought it possible that she would face similar challenges, but she was excited to explore her new country. David and Lily Chin were married in 1948. They bought a house in the Detroit suburb of Highland Park. Upon arriving in Michigan, David proudly introduced his new bride to American culture by taking her to a baseball game. But according to family members who spoke to the San Francisco Examiner, fans kicked and spit at the Chinese couple. It was their first encounter with racism, but it certainly would not be their last. In early 1949, Lily had a miscarriage. Little more than a year into her marriage, a doctor informed Lily that she would be unable to have children. While this news must have been crushing, Lily shifted her focus to adoption. After nearly a decade of transcontinental red tape, the Chins adopted their only child, who they named Vincent. When Vincent was 10, he officially became an American citizen. Motherhood cast America in a new, promising light for Lily Chin. She made friends with other students' mothers, took Vincent and his friends on outings, and supported her son in varied interests that included writing poetry and fishing. From an early age, it was clear just how intelligent Vincent was. He excelled at school, enjoyed popularity among his peers, and set his aspirations high. When Vincent was 16, the Chins moved to Oak Park, another Detroit suburb that was considered a better neighborhood than the previous one. The family moved into a tiny three-bedroom ranch. It was the best they could afford as working-class parents struggling to make ends meet. Throughout Vincent's childhood, his mother worked in a brush factory while his father earned a modest wage as a waiter and laundry worker. Any money they could spare was deposited into a savings account intended for their son's future. Vincent was well-liked throughout his school years. His childhood friend Gary Koivu told author Paula Yu, I was always the quiet one. I never did say too much and it was difficult for me to make friends. Vince could walk into a place and get to know people real well. He's always the life of the party. He's always laughing and joking. I kind of admired that. I wish I had the gift of gab. His natural charisma caught the attention of Vicky Wong. Vicky said Vince's warm smile was the first thing she noticed about him. She told the Detroit Free Press, Vince was a happy person, positive, always on the go. He had a lot of goals in life. They began dating in 1980. Just a year into their relationship, Vincent proposed. A wedding date of June 28, 1982 was chosen by the happy couple, which happened to be a Monday night. Lee Schaefer, a friend and co-worker of the bride, explained to the Detroit Free Press a Monday wedding was intentional because many of their friends worked in Chinese restaurants, which are usually closed on Mondays. That way, everybody could be there. The couple also didn't want to cut into their friends' work time on a weekend, when they usually got their biggest tips. Sadly, Vincent's father would never make it to his son's wedding. In November of 1981, David Chen passed away after a long battle with kidney disease. The loss of his father fueled Vincent's drive to succeed at the American dream. According to his friend Jimmy Choi, in an interview with author Paula Yu, when his father died, Vincent began to worry. He didn't want to end up as a waiter or working in laundry like his dad. He wanted to get ahead. After high school, Vincent commuted to the Control Data Institute, a computer trade school. 
He quickly landed a job as a draftsman at Efficient Engineering Company. The firm, based out of Troy, Michigan, provided mechanical engineering work for automotive and aircraft companies. Even though he lacked experience, Vincent was given the remarkable opportunity to help design cars. Vincent's supervisor, Gene Blair, explained to the Detroit Free Press, he was hired as a computer terminal operator and as a draftsman. But he was so intelligent and industrious that we quickly realized his potential on the drafting board and put him on the board full time. He went on to refer to Vincent as a young man on his way up to bigger and better things here. On weekends, Vincent could be found working at the Golden Star, a Chinese restaurant in nearby Ferndale. He waited tables as a temporary measure to save up for the wedding. He and Vicky were also searching for a large house where they hoped to live with Vincent's recently widowed mother and the children they planned to add to their family. For their honeymoon, Vincent and Vicky planned an island getaway to Aruba. They would also be celebrating Vicky's 24th birthday while they were there. It felt like the young couple had everything to look forward to. They couldn't wait to start building a life together. On June 19th, just a few weeks before his wedding, Vincent's closest friends took him out for a bachelor party. It was his last hurrah as a young single guy, and despite his mother's protests, Vincent was determined to have one last boys' night out. The night began around 7 p.m. at a topless bar, where Vincent met up with his friends Bob Sorosky and Gary Koivu. They had a few drinks there and then stopped at a liquor store for a pint of vodka. Gary made a pit stop to pick up a third friend of Vincent's, Jimmy Choi. The four men headed to Vincent's old stomping grounds of Highland Park. In town, there was a topless bar known as the Fancy Pants Lounge. Vincent had been to Fancy Pants several times before, often enough that dancers had started to recognize him when he came in. The historic building had once been called the Highland Theater. Built in 1915, its Art Deco accents convey its former life as a lavish movie palace. By the 1980s, the building had morphed into an adult entertainment club, standing between abandoned auto factories and shattered storefronts. The Fancy Pants Lounge's exterior was a somber relic of Detroit's past. Inside, it was a different story. With topless women dancing to rock and pop music of the day, the venue attracted all sorts of men. It happened to be a Saturday night, the busiest time of week at the lounge. Vincent and his group of friends sat near the front of the elevated runway, giving extra attention and tips to their favorite dancers. 42-year-old Ronald Ebens and his stepson, 23-year-old Michael Nitz, weren't even supposed to be there that night. The two men had planned on attending a baseball game at Tiger Stadium, but they were running late. When they checked the score after dinner, Ebens and Nitz found out their home team was getting pummeled by the Milwaukee Brewers in a 10-3 game. At that point, they decided not to go to the game after all, opting instead to stop by the Fancy Pants Lounge for a last call. Ebens and his stepson had first bonded over their love of baseball. They would watch major league games on TV together and played the sport twice a week, with some batting practice at the cages in between. Ebens had met Michael's mother, Juanita, at Chrysler's auto assembly line. Michael was 12 when they married, which can be a tough age to start a father-stepson relationship. But to Juanita's delight, her new husband and son got along remarkably well. After the wedding, Ebens transferred from rural Michigan to the big city of Detroit to be with his wife. Over the years, Ebens had worked his way up from assembly worker to supervisor. In 1982, he was superintendent of the Warren Truck Assembly Plant. Ebens and his stepson had more in common than baseball. Michael Nitz had also worked in the automobile manufacturing industry until recently. While attending college, Nitz had worked part-time in an auto factory. After less than a year of employment, Nitz was laid off. The two men were a generation apart, but both of them felt the tremors rocking the American auto industry. It was after 10 p.m. when the father and stepson sat down by the stage just a few feet across from Vincent and his friends. The group nodded at each other in acknowledgement. It wasn't long before Ebens started making loud comments and slinging racial slurs. Vincent and his friends were a diverse group. Jimmy and Vincent were Asian, 
and Bob and Gary were white, but the middle-aged white man seemed to direct most of his derisive remarks at Vincent and Jimmy. According to Paula Yu's book, a 24-year-old dancer named Racine Colwell saw Ebens and Nitz antagonizing Vincent's group. Colwell said Ebens condescendingly called Vincent boy and shouted in his direction, it's because of little motherfuckers like you that we're out of work. Vincent got out of his chair and confronted Ebens. Accounts vary over who started the physical altercation, but Nitz soon joined in. During the tussle, Nitz was hit on the forehead by a chair. The fight was quickly broken up by a doorman and parking attendant. Both groups of men were swiftly kicked out of the club. Out on the sidewalk, the argument resumed and Ebens grabbed a Louisville Slugger baseball bat out of the trunk of Nitz's car. Vincent and Jimmy then took off running while Ebens struggled to keep up. He and Nitz lost sight of the men and returned to their car. Ebens had planned to get his stepson medical attention for his forehead gash, but shifted his focus to tracking down Vincent instead. I take my skincare routine seriously, and my latest area of concern is fine lines. Damn you, 40s. Not only that, with the current season, my skin has been a little dry. I recently started using proven skincare, and it completely changed my routine. Their products are rooted in science, which is probably why they're so effective. Proven skincare have studied over 20,000 ingredients from more than 100,000 skincare products and over 28 million testimonials. All of this rigorous research means that they've collected crucial data that allows them to identify precisely what your skin needs. Proven Skincare has a unique three-step system that's a game changer. There's a cleanser, a daily moisturizer with SPF, and a night cream. These simple yet effective products have replaced the bundle of products I previously used on my skin. And every eight weeks, Proven Skincare updates my formulas to account for my changing environment or other reasons my skin might evolve. Right now, I'm using a deeply moisturizing formula due to the weather, and my skin is thanking me for it. Give your skin exactly what it needs with Proven Skincare. Go to ProvenSkincare.com to take the free skin genome quiz and use code MURDERISH for $20 off your first order. That's ProvenSkincare.com code MURDERISH for $20 off your first order. ProvenSkincare.com code MURDERISH. I've gotten into British TV recently and Acorn TV has given me access to hundreds of exclusive shows including dramas, comedies, award-winning mysteries, and a lot more. Being that Acorn TV is the largest commercial-free British streaming service, you're not gonna find the compelling stories and originals they offer anywhere else. The visuals, the creative writing, and the acting keep me coming back for more. Their series, Under the Vines, is a dramedy that follows two city slickers who've never done a lick of outdoor labor, yet the unlikely pair find themselves inheriting a failing vineyard in New Zealand. What really hooked me on the show was that I had to see how these two would find a way to turn the vineyard around so they could sell it, split the money, and get the heck out of there. I think you guys will love Acorn TV's content as much as I do, and the low price tag to get access to it. With Acorn TV, I always get my British fix, and you can too. Try Acorn TV free for 30 days by going to acorn.tv and using my promo code MURDERISH, but you have to enter the code in all lowercase letters. That's A-C-O-R-N TV, promo code MURDERISH, to get your first 30 days for free. Acorn.tv, code MURDERISH. If you were searching for podcasts to listen to and you came across an episode titled Diana Survived a Plane Crash or Dan Was Mauled by a Bear, what would you do? Well, you'd hit the play button right away, right? The podcast episodes I just mentioned and more are featured on a podcast called What Was That Like? In each episode, host Scott allows people to provide a firsthand account of an unusual event in their life, like Brooke, who lost her leg in a shark attack. You'll even hear a familiar voice on the podcast because I was a guest on What Was That Like when I told my own personal story about the time a strange man followed me home and I found him in my bedroom. On What Was That Like, real people tell unreal stories. You're going to be hooked on this podcast as the stories told on it almost seem too insane to be real, but they are. 
What Was That Like is available wherever you listen to podcasts. Don't forget to hit follow or subscribe so you never miss an episode of What Was That Like. Ebens and Nitz circle the surrounding streets for 30 minutes before tracking Vincent down outside of a Woodward Avenue McDonald's. It was just four blocks from the Fancy Pants Lounge. When Eben saw Vincent laughing with his friend Jimmy, he automatically assumed the men were laughing at him for not catching them. Ebens and his stepson approached inconspicuously, using a truck to obstruct their target's line of sight. Nitz ran up behind Vincent and caught him in a surprise bear hug, while Ebens ambushed him with the baseball bat. He struck Vincent's head and shoulders as he tried to flee. Through a racist lens, it didn't matter to Ebens and Nitz that Vincent was actually Chinese, not Japanese like some of the companies blamed for American unemployment. The fact that Vincent was of Asian descent seemed to trigger years of built-up tension and resentment, driving every swing and fall of the heavy wooden bat. Two off-duty police officers, Morris Cotton and Michael Gardenhire, witnessed the brutal attack. Cotton was working his side job that night as a McDonald's security guard and was helping a customer jumpstart their car when Ebens and Nitz pulled up. Gardenhire and Cotton gave their account of events in Paula Yu's book about the case. Gardenhire said, Mr. Ebens was standing over him with the baseball bat and he was just pounding him in the head like he was hitting a golf ball. He hit him four times, four times. There was blood coming from everywhere, out of his ears and everywhere. Also quoted by author Paula Yu, Cotton described Ebens' demeanor by saying, his eyes were glazed, he was in heat of rage, and he had his bat up. He was swinging that baseball bat as if he were going for a home run. At one point, Vincent broke free from Nitz's grip and Ebens lunged after him. Both officers flashed their badges and commanded Ebens to stand down, but he struck one last time, rendering Vincent motionless on the cold pavement. It was obvious to both Cotton and Gardenhire that Vincent Chin needed immediate medical attention. Cotton put out an EMS dispatch and waited for help to arrive, hoping it wasn't too late for the young man who had been viciously attacked. According to the San Francisco Examiner, Vincent used his last ounce of strength to whisper to his friend Jimmy, it isn't fair. Then he slipped away, surrendering to unconsciousness. Sergeant Gerald Allen Thompson, a veteran EMS technician and firefighter with the Highland Park Fire Department, was just three blocks away. He arrived at the scene within minutes and was horrified by what he saw. Right away, Ebens tried to get Thompson's attention for his stepson's forehead wound. Nitz would later receive 11 stitches. But at the crime scene, Thompson believed Vincent's condition was far more pressing. As quoted by Paula Yu, Thompson described his observations at the scene of the assault. There was brains laying on the street. Chin was obviously in a fatal condition. He wasn't dead yet. He was semi-conscious. But from my experience of being on the street for so long, the man was a goner. I've seen a lot of violent death, but none exactly like that. And it was obvious, you know, that he'd been beaten. Beaten, I mean, not just hit once in the head. He was beaten. He had broken bones all over. You know, collarbone, ribs, skull. Vincent Chin was rushed to the Henry Ford Hospital in critical condition. Dr. Jeffrey Cresilius, a neurosurgery resident there, immediately brought him in for surgery. For five tireless hours, Dr. Cresilius tried to treat the damage to Vincent's brain. There was so much swelling and bruising that he had to remove bones on both sides of Vincent's skull to alleviate pressure. While Vincent was in surgery, two of his friends were frantically searching for him. Bob and Gary went around the area asking if anyone had seen Vincent in nearby bars, at the lot where they were parked earlier, and in any of the liquor stores in the neighborhood. Having no luck finding him, they headed for the Golden Star restaurant, thinking maybe Vincent and Jimmy were waiting for them there. To their shock, a waiter let them know that Vincent was in the hospital, fighting for his life. Four days later, Vincent remained in a medically induced coma. Dr. Cresilius said that his brain had continued to swell and he had maybe a 5% chance of survival. 
Lily Chin sat in quiet contemplation, and then she made the impossible decision to take her son off of life support. Instead of helping to finalize wedding plans, Vincent's loved ones set their sights on planning a funeral. Asian American rights activist Helen Zia first learned about Vincent Chin's death in the Detroit Free Press. On July 1, 1982, there was an article on the front page with a photo of Vincent and Vicky below the headline, Slaying Kills Couples Dream. The fact that there was a news feature about Asian Americans at all caught Zia's attention, but the depiction of a young Asian couple ripped apart by tragedy on the front page was highly unusual. As Zia told author Paula Yu, it was zero about Asian Americans ever, and suddenly to see this article and this picture of a Chinese American, his father and mother and bride-to-be and this story, and this was 1982, and the fact that he was killed, I had a visceral reaction. Countless others from Detroit's Asian American community and beyond united over Vincent's murder. In San Francisco, where 12% of the city's population were Chinese Americans, according to a 1980 census, several hundred demonstrators gathered in protest of the apparent hate crime. According to the San Francisco Examiner, Harold Fong of the Chinese American Citizens Alliance told the crowd, My blood boiled when I first learned that Vincent Chin was deliberately attacked and murdered as an act of racial hatred. George Wong, a member of the Asian American Federation of Union Membership, shared similar sentiments. He told the San Francisco Examiner, The killing of Vincent Chin happened in 1982, not 1882, the year of the Chinese Exclusion Act. What disturbs me is that the two men who brutally clubbed Vincent Chin to death in Detroit were thinking the same thoughts as the lynch mob in San Francisco Chinatown a hundred years ago. Kill the foreigners to save our jobs. The Chinese must go. When corporate heads tell frustrated workers the foreign imports are taking their jobs, then they are acting like an agitator of a lynch mob. To many advocacy groups, the assault that took Vincent Chin's life was emblematic of a national issue. But for those closest to Vincent, it was deeply personal. Vincent's mother, Lily Chin, told the San Francisco Examiner, I don't understand how this could happen in America. My husband fought for this country. Before, I really loved America, but now this has made me really angry. This felt like a betrayal of everything the Chins had worked so hard to achieve. Vincent had been on a clear path for success, and it had been callously ripped away in a single night. In addition to this being a tragedy for the family, the loss was profoundly devastating to Vicki Wong, the woman Vincent had been on the brink of marrying. Vicki Wong conveyed her reaction to the Chicago Tribune, saying, I can't believe that someone could hate Vince so much that he would kill him in such a cruel way, like an animal. There was a common thread between Vincent's loved ones and Asian American communities across the United States. They wanted justice for this heinous attack. The widespread racism had gone on long enough, and Vincent's murder had brought a marginalized issue to the forefront. Surely the justice system could use his assailants to set an example, have their punishment send the message that crimes driven by racism would not be tolerated. But would the system do the right thing? Only time would tell. On the night of the incident, Michael Nitz gave a statement to Officer Cotton. According to Paula Yu's book, his statement read, We were at a bar, I was struck over the head with a chair, and another guy started to throw punches after I was struck over the head. We chased out of the parking lot, and after that, I don't recall what happened. Initially, only Ebens was taken into police custody, as he was seen as the main instigator. When news broke that Vincent had passed away, Ebens and Nitz were charged with second-degree murder and held on $5,000 bond, or roughly $14,000 today. Then, a defense attorney showed up at the Highland Park Police Station to represent Ebens. The attorney managed to convince Lieutenant Donald Roberts, a 19-year veteran at the time, to release Ebens without bond. According to Paula Yu's book, Detective Roberts wasn't concerned about Evans getting out of jail, saying, we checked the guy, he had no record, he worked at Chrysler, he owned his home. The attorney said he had known him for 30 years, a very respectable attorney. 
You don't figure anybody's going to take off on you on a deal like that, which they didn't. Officer Cotton, who'd witnessed the heinous attack, was stunned to hear that Evans was being released. He told Lieutenant Roberts the crime was a perfect example of lying in wait. As quoted by author Paula Yu, Cotton said, I don't know what happened at the club, but they had a chance to think about everything they were going to do since they left the club. The Fancy Pants is a quarter mile away. They had time to think about what they were going to do. When you asked him why the release without bond was so upsetting to him, Cotton responded, I locked up black people for smoking marijuana and they were letting the white guy go. It was devastating to see that, that really bothered me. But Lieutenant Roberts wasn't the only one being nonchalant about the assault. According to the Chicago Tribune, a Wayne County prosecutor agreed this was a barroom brawl that got out of hand, a killing in the heat of anger, no premeditation. Ebens and Nitz were released until a preliminary hearing on October 5th with the 30th District Court in Highland Park. Judge Thomas Bales retained the second-degree murder charges despite believing it was too lenient. According to the Chicago Tribune, the judge said, Gentlemen, I am of the opinion that the defendants in this case were undercharged. The elements of first-degree murder are here. There was more than enough time for the blood to cool, to have gone home and thought about this. He did not go home. He took his bat and chased around Highland Park, and he found the victim. I say to you, gentlemen, that there was willful, deliberate, premeditated killing of a human being. Judge Bales' opposition to the leniency seemed to be an uncommon one. In February of 1983, the state and the defense reached a plea deal. In exchange for guilty pleas, the charges would be reduced to third-degree manslaughter. This downgraded charge carried no minimum sentence. It was the judge's discretion how the perpetrators should be brought to justice. On March 16th, Wayne County Circuit Judge Charles S. Kaufman only heard statements from the defense in support of the manslaughter charges. This was because no prosecutors were in attendance to push for a harsher sentence. According to Michigan lawyer Roland Huang, at the time, it wasn't unusual for prosecutors to miss sentencing hearings. It just wasn't considered a critical component of legal proceedings. In addition, it wasn't routine for victims' friends and family to make victim impact statements. This seems unthinkable nowadays, when these statements have been known to influence sentencing decisions. As if to justify the reduced charges, both Ebens and Nitz's defense attorneys highlighted the lack of prior convictions for both of them. They also added an allegation that the victim started the fight. After deciding to hunt down and level a surprise, savage attack against Vincent Chin, which ended his life, Ebens and Nitz were sentenced to three years probation, a fine of $3,000, and $780 in court fees. Judge Kaufman was later quoted in the Chicago Tribune as saying, these weren't the kind of men you send to jail. You don't make the punishment fit the crime. You make the punishment fit the criminal. The outcome was deeply disappointing, but not altogether surprising. Judge Kaufman had a reputation for going easy on first-time offenders. Detroit's Asian-American community was appalled by the utter lack of justice. Helen Zia commented to CNN, it was a complete failure of the criminal justice system. Lily Chin could not believe her son's killers wouldn't be dealt more serious consequences. She told the San Francisco Examiner, what kind of law is this? What kind of justice? This happened because my son is Chinese. If two Chinese killed a white person, they must go to jail. Maybe for their whole lives, something is wrong with this country. Henry Yi, a restaurant owner and the unofficial mayor of Detroit's Chinatown at the time, remarked to the Chicago Tribune, You can kill a dog and get 30 days. We will not forget. If it takes a year, two, three, we can wait. It wasn't just Asian Detroitians who were outraged. Many city residents were opposed to the ruling. Local media was used to express public disdain for the judge's determination. Detroit Free Press columnist Nikki McWhirter criticized the judgment by writing, You have raised the ugly ghost of racism, suggesting in your explanation that the lives of the killers are of great and continuing value to society. 
implying they are of greater value than the life of a slain victim. How gross and ostentatious of you! How callous and, yes, unjust! A group of Vincent's friends, Asian American lawyers, and Detroit citizens decided to take matters into their own hands. On March 1, 1983, they met at the Golden Star where Vincent had worked on weekends and formed American Citizens for Justice, or ACJ. Activist Helen Zia was one of several co-founders. Over the course of the next few months, ACJ gathered tens of thousands of signatures for a petition presented to Judge Kaufman. But the judge refused to reverse the decision. Instead of dwelling in defeat, ACJ members aimed higher. They wrote to the governor, Michigan's attorney general, and even TV newsman Ted Koppel. One member of ACJ was Vincent's friend, Claude Durand, who told the Chicago Tribune, it's not my habit to have friends drop dead and not do something about it. ACJ got a response from Assistant Attorney General William Bradford Reynolds, who was quoted in the Kansas City Times as commenting, I see this as a terribly brutal incident that was treated with apparently way too light a sentence. We don't tolerate this kind of activity, whether it's aimed at Blacks, Hispanics, or Asians. Widespread outrage had fueled what the San Francisco Examiner called a political electricity that spread far and wide. Finally, cracks in the cultural veneer were being exposed. The San Francisco Examiner cited commercials and promotional campaigns to buy American and popular bumper stickers that taunted unemployment made in Japan, which have contributed to the racist hysteria pervasive among white American workers. It was misguided anger, according to the newspaper, since frustrations over the rupture in the American auto industry were directed at the entire country of Japan. It was never addressed that Detroit's big three car manufacturers might be accountable for their own collapse since they failed to modernize their production. Asian American communities across America expressed their discontent over the way the case was handled. Rallies were held in Chicago, New York, Los Angeles, and San Francisco, with participants wearing red and white buttons that read, Justice for Vincent Chin. There was enough of a commotion at that point to grab the attention of the media in other countries. Reporters from Singapore, Hong Kong, and China all traveled to Detroit to track the movement. ACJ managed to raise $50,000, which was used in efforts to get the case reopened. Ebens and Nitz could not be tried again in Michigan State Criminal Court because it would be considered double jeopardy. So ACJ hoped for a federal trial. In April 1983, the FBI spurred into action at the request of the Department of Justice. Agents assigned to the case were asked to determine if Vincent Chin's civil rights had been violated. During their investigation, FBI agents learned that Highland Park Police had failed to interview key witnesses, including the dancer at the Fancy Pants Lounge, who had overheard Ebens and Nitz shouting racial epithets. After picking up the pieces left unexamined by state prosecutors, federal investigators determined they had enough of a case to put Ebens and Nitz before a grand jury. Adulting is a bundle of WTFs multiple times a day. Sometimes we need a break from the day-to-day -day drab with a few cuss words or just a laugh. The Smartass and Sass subscription box does just that. It essentially puts adulting in a timeout. Inside the Smartass and Sass subscription box, you'll find snarky gifts like a t-shirt that says, thou shalt not try me. My best friend works hard and deals with a lot at work. I think she'd love Smart Ass and Sass, especially the fresh out of fucks magnet that came in one of their previous boxes. Each Smart Ass and Sass big box comes with one snarky t-shirt, has between seven to nine unique items, and is valued at at least $90. Come on, you know your Smart Ass best friend would much prefer to get this as a gift than another gift card to the local coffee shop. Let Smart Ass and Sass do the mouthy talking for you. Visit smartassandsass.com and use my code MURDERISH for 10% off first-time subscription orders. This can't be combined with other offers and it's not valid on shop orders. That's smartassandsass.com, promo code MURDERISH for 10% off first-time subscription orders. 
Melting into the couch and watching a Sundance Now true crime show is like my reward at the end of a hard day. Sundance Now is an ad-free streaming service created for people like you and me who are into creative storytelling and fresh perspectives. There are romance shows, period dramas, true crime, and thrillers that will have you hiding behind a pillow, or at least that's how I reacted. On their featured series list is a fan-favorite fantasy-based show called A Discovery of Witches. In this Sundance Now original, two characters return from their trip to 1590 to find tragedy. They have to find the Book of Life and its missing pages before their enemies have the opportunity to get revenge. I found my next TV obsession on Sundance Now, and you will too. Try Sundance Now free for 30 days by going to SundanceNow.com and use promo code MURDERISH. That's SundanceNow.com, code MURDERISH, for 30 days of free streaming. SundanceNow.com, code MURDERISH. Later that year, both Ebens and Nitz were indicted on two counts, interfering with Vincent Chin's right to be in a place of public accommodation and conspiring to do so. The involvement of the federal government in this case was unprecedented. This case held the distinction of being the first federal civil rights trial involving an Asian American in U.S. history. The pressure was on to give Vincent's loved ones the justice they deserved. The federal trial of the United States versus Ronald Ebens and Michael Nitz unfolded in late June of 1984. The trial was held in Michigan District Court, despite the men filing a formal request for a change of venue. Before a jury of seven women and five men, 36 witnesses testified about the night in question. Prosecutor Theodore Merritt acknowledged to the jury that Vincent was an active participant in the initial brawl at the club. But, Merritt argued, the aggressive actions of Ebens, which ultimately led to the victim's death, were racially motivated. According to Paula Yu's book, in closing arguments, Merritt said about Vincent Chin, he ran for his life. He knew that Eben's bigotry now was armed with a deadly weapon. Merritt ended with an impactful proclamation. This was more than some barroom fight. This was violent hatred turned loose. This was years of pent-up racial hostilities and rage unleashed. This was a modern-day lynching but there was a bat instead of a rope. You quoted defense attorney Frank Eamon as saying, witnesses were straining to inject racism into these events to help in this second prosecution. Eamon did not argue in favor of Nitz and Eben's innocence, but instead focused on the assault not being at all about race or civil rights. He said the fight happened due to toxic masculinity and the victim's race was arbitrary. Merritt argued, however, that Ebens and Nitz would have responded to the altercation much differently if Vincent and all his companions were white like them. It would ultimately be up to the jury to decide on the motive. On June 28, 1984, the jury reached a verdict after 12 hours of deliberation. They found Michael Nitz not guilty on both counts, acquitting him of all charges. Ronald Ebens was found not guilty of conspiracy, but guilty of violating Vincent Chin's civil rights. At a September 18th sentencing hearing, Ebens attorney Frank Eamon asked Judge Anna Diggs Taylor to extend compassion to his client. As cited in Yu's book, Eamon told the judge that Ebens had been an upstanding citizen who led the life of an average, hardworking Midwesterner who in 30 minutes of his life went berserk and acted out of character. Meanwhile, prosecutor Theodore Merritt recommended a sentence to Judge Taylor that he believed was suitable. As quoted in Yu's book, the prosecutor stated, a 30-year sentence would appropriately reflect society's intolerance of violent and antisocial behavior. Judge Taylor sentenced Ebens to 25 years in prison. The thing is, Ebens would not spend a single day behind bars. In the months that followed, Ebens was released on $20,000 bond and placed under house arrest while he awaited the results of an appeal. In the court filing, his attorneys asserted that Ebens was not given a fair trial. His motion for a change of venue was disregarded before the trial, despite extensive publicity surrounding the case. 
The appeal also stated federal prosecutors failed to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that Ebens made the racist statements admitted into evidence. Lastly, the prosecution was criticized for allegedly coaching witnesses to corroborate their testimony. In a September 11, 1986 ruling, it was decided that Eben's conviction would be reversed. A week later, on September 19, the Department of Justice decided to hold a retrial. It had been nearly two years since Eben's had been sentenced to 25 years in prison, yet he had managed to avoid any form of incarceration. A second federal trial was held in Cincinnati, Ohio, on April 22, 1987. This time, a tape recording of prosecutor Lisa Chan's May 1983 meeting with Jimmy Choi, Bob Sorosky, and Gary Koivu was admissible as evidence. It would prove to jurors whether Vincent's friends had been coached. The defense maintained that the assault that ended Vincent's life was not racially motivated. According to Yu's book, in closing statements, defense attorney David Lawson stated, this is not a lunch counter in Atlanta. This is not a bus in Montgomery. This is a girly club in Highland Park. There is no evidence that this homicide is racial. Deliberations lasted 10 and a half hours, extended over two days. According to NPR, the jury was made up of mostly white men who were blue collar workers, just like Ebens. On May 1st, 1987, the unanimous verdict was read, not guilty. All charges against Vincent's killer were dismissed. Asian Americans all over the country could not believe where this roller coaster of a case had come to a grinding halt. Activist Helen Zia captured what so many others were feeling at the second trial's conclusion by telling CNN, It was heartbreaking. It was a travesty of justice. It was seeing all the effort that we had put in, years of getting the word out, just reversed. Helen Zia maintained a strong friendship with Lily Chin for many years. After Lily's death in June of 2002 from cancer, Zia became executor of the Chin estate. Based on a 1987 civil lawsuit settled out of court, Ebens was ordered to pay the Chin estate $1.5 million with interest. To this day, the estate has not received any of that money. In an October 2021 interview, Ebens told CNN he was living paycheck to paycheck. In March of 1987, PBS released the documentary Who Killed Vincent Chin as part of their POV series. The film, which is directed by Christine Choi and Renee Tahima Pena, received an Oscar nomination in 1989. Then in 2009, writer and producer Curtis Chin, no relation to Vincent, released the documentary Vincent Who to educate newer generations about why the case is timeless. The documentary also examines the Chinese Exclusion Act, Japanese American internment camps during World War II, and post-9-11 racial profiling. The documentary is shown at universities all over the country as a discussion point for the historical narrative of Asian Americans and the role it's had on racially motivated hate crimes. Paula Yu's 2021 book, From a Whisper to a Rallying Cry, is geared toward young adult readers. Vincent Chin's story is told in an accessible way, while tying in elements of today's cultural climate. In her afterward, she remarks, COVID-19 is not the only virus plaguing our world. Racism is also a virus that we must cure. We will always continue to fight back against hate. This is what Vincent Chin's legacy has taught us. In the Asian American Writers Workshop newsletter, The Margins, essayist Mark Sang Putterman wrote, through retellings in campus workshops, community film screenings, and protest signs, Chin's murder has taken on a folkloric feel. Making sure that his story gets retold means Vincent will never be forgotten, no matter how many decades pass since his life was taken. While Vincent Chin's mother, Lily, did not get any closure in her lifetime, hopefully she found some solace in the fact that Vincent's murder increased awareness of Asian Americans being targeted. His case paved the way for change. Roland Huang, co-founder and former president of American Citizens for Justice, told NBC News, the Vincent Chin case forced Asian Americans into the civil rights discourse. 
it transformed a biracial discussion on race relations to a multiracial one. Along with other cases, this case serves as a wake-up call to address anti-Asian bias and racial intolerance. In spite of Helen Zia's initial disappointment in the final outcome, she continues to take note of its impact. According to NBC News, she said, it wasn't all for naught. A whole movement has been created. Organizations formed. There were new generations of Asian Americans who were becoming civil rights lawyers because of this case. Zia recognized after the second federal trial that nothing more could be done to bring Vincent's killer to justice. She continues to look toward the future, telling author Paula Yu, all we can do is continue doing what we've been doing, to educate people about it, and to make sure it doesn't happen again. The stereotype that Asians in America are not targets of racial violence certainly played a significant role in Vincent Chin's case. Vincent Chin's case tends to resurface in editorials over the years. When his case is mentioned, it's said to serve as a rallying cry. What happened to Vincent has empowered Asian Americans all over the country to seek justice when similar crimes are committed. On a national level, the case has influenced the legal system in a variety of ways. As a result of this case and several others, Congress passed the Victims of Crime Act in 1984. Paired with the 1982 Victim and Witness Protection Act, victim impact statements are now encouraged in court proceedings. Since 1990, when the Hate Crime Statistics Act was signed into law, crimes like the one against Vincent have been tracked nationally. Unfortunately, similar crimes are all too common in present times. In a January 2002 article, NBC News cited a report published by the Center for the Study of Hate and Extremism. The report indicates anti-Asian hate crime increased 339% between 2020 and 2021. Many have pointed to the rhetoric used early on in the global COVID-19 pandemic as being the cause for the significant increase in Asian hate crime. Phrases like Chinese flu were used after the virus was suspected to emerge from a lab in Wuhan, China, and once again, Asian Americans began being scapegoated as a whole. American Citizens for Justice was founded in reaction to what happened to Vincent Chin, but their work did not stop there. Today, the organization continues to educate the public about Asian American discrimination and provide assistance to other victims of racial injustice. In addition to offering legal advice, ACJ serves as an advocate for Asian Americans in matters involving law enforcement, networking, legislation, education, and health. Strides are being made to assist targets of racial discrimination, but we might still have a long way to go. James Shimora of ACJ was quoted in Yu's book as commenting, History seems to be repeating itself. Some always try to find scapegoats for social and economic ills. The target changes, but the issue remains the same. Over the years since the second federal trial, Ronald Ebens has been contacted by reporters for commentary. He still insists the crime was not fueled by racism and that his memory of that night remains hazy. In June of 2012, he told NBC News that the deadly assault was the only wrong thing I ever done in my life. It's absolutely true. I'm sorry it happened, and if there's any way to undo it, I'd do it. Two monuments were created in Vincent Chin's honor across the street from the former Golden Star restaurant where he used to work. The first was a Michigan legal milestone marker by the State Bar of Michigan and the Michigan Asian Pacific American Bar Association. It's dedicated to Vincent Chin and reads, from a whisper to a rallying cry. In June of 2010, the Ferndale City Council donated a plaque in memory of Vincent Chin. He is buried beside his mother and father in Forest Lawn Cemetery. As incidents of racial violence continue to be addressed in 2022, Vincent Chin's killing is just as relevant as it was when it happened in 1982. It highlights that significant crimes like this have been historically mishandled. And while no one can change the past, perhaps the best way to honor Vincent Chin's memory is to take action and be part of the positive change. Thank you for joining me on this episode of Murderish. 
If you want access to ad-free bonus episodes of Murderish, consider becoming a Patreon supporter. Visit Murderish.com, click the link to go behind the scenes to become a Patreon supporter of the show. All patrons get access to ad-free bonus episodes and other cool perks. Linda, Paris Renee, Sharon S., Jackie G., and Jamie B. are the most recent people to become Murderish Patreon supporters. Thank you all so much. I appreciate your support. If you're planning to attend CrimeCon in Las Vegas this year, use my promo code MURDERISH for 10% off a standard badge. That's code MURDERISH for 10% off. Hope to see you there. CrimeCon is a lot of fun. If you enjoy this podcast, do me the biggest favor and rate and review Murderish in your favorite podcast app. Positive ratings and reviews help new listeners find the show, and I also love to hear from you guys. Also, follow me on Instagram at Murderish Podcast. It's my favorite place to engage with you guys. You can also find me on Twitter and Facebook. Check out Murderish.com if you want to buy Murderish t-shirts, face masks, coffee mugs, and more. Murderish sound design and audio editing is by Justin Hellstrom. Some of the music was composed by Nico of We Talk of Dreams. This episode was researched and written by Allison Schwartz. Visit Murderish.com if you'd like to see a list of sources used for this episode. As always, Ishers, thank you for joining me on another episode of Murderish. And remember, listening to this podcast doesn't make you a murderer. It just means you're murder-ish.